next uh, lecture course is by Ole Wagner uh, from uh, University of Queensland on uh, metric functions, shoot functions, and related things. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, thanks, Leo, for uh, the great uh, opportunity to talk to you here. Um, I think in the program it's announced that I'm going to talk about symmetric functions and sure processes. Um, I'm not actually sure I'll get to the second part of that title. Um, next week, both lecture courses will heavily rely on symmetric functions, so I've agreed to at least make sure that I give you a proper introduction into the subject, and so that's eaten a little bit sort of into my time that I'd hope to talk about sure processes, but maybe, maybe we'll get there, we'll, we'll see. Um, I'm also aware that quite a few of you will be familiar with symmetric functions already, uh, but maybe not everyone, and uh, so hopefully you'll still learn something new, even if you've been working uh, with symmetric functions for a long time, and in particular I'll try to, not so much today, because I need to go through some really standard basic definitions, but later in the week, at least give you a point of view of symmetric functions. That's perhaps not exactly the same as what you'll find in, let's say, a book by McDonald, which is sort of the standard reference to symmetric functions. So in particular, I'll, I'll talk about things like lambda rings and the structure of the ring of symmetric functions as a Hopf algebra and some other sort of integrable structures behind, behind the theory, so vertex operators and so on. Okay, so, so hopefully there is something new for everyone. Um, but anyway, uh, another thing before I start, right, it's, it's always difficult to give a, a lecture where you're just talking to the audience and the audience isn't talking back. So I'm expecting lots of questions and uh, hopefully I can answer most of them. But in any case, so please feel free to interrupt me if anything is, is unclear, all right? So, all right, well, let's, let's start. So. As I said, the main topic is symmetric functions. And before we can start to talk about symmetric functions, I need to talk about partitions, because essentially they are going to be the objects that will label sort of any useful basis of the ring of symmetric functions. Okay, so that's sort of my very first topic is partitions. And of course, most of you will have seen partitions before, but uh, in any case, we'll, we'll need these partitions, not just as a basis, but also some sort of combinatorial things that we're going to see later uh, when we talk about the sure functions. Okay, in any case, let's just start at the very beginning. So what is a partition? Okay, so definition of a partition. So I'll typically use letters like lambda, mu, and nu, and so on to denote a partition. For me, that's just going to be a sequence of No negative integers such that, well, so first of all, such that lambda i is greater or equal to lambda i plus 1, and such that, which I'll write as the absolute value of the partition, which is simply going to be the sum of all of the lambda i that this is finite. So in other words, you only can have finitely many of these. So it's essentially a weakly decreasing sequence of non-negative integers, but at some point we stabilize and we just get zero. Okay? So, so e.g., I don't know, 4, 4, 3, 2, 1, 1, and let's say a stop after that. And typically, it's more convenient to just not write down the zeros, okay? So I'm not always going to write this as, as a, an infinite sequence. Okay, so, well, 
again, there's some f sta a number of sort of standard things or statistics on partitions. So the, let's just quickly run through them. The length of a partition, well, maybe first, before I do that, let's just say that if, if the parts, or if the partition, this sum is equal to n, okay, so in this case, that's 8, 10, 13, I think that's 15 in the actual example, then we also write, and we say that lambda is a partition of n. Okay, so lambda okay, and secondly, if lambda k is strictly positive and lambda k plus one is zero, then the length is defined to be exactly k. Okay, so in particular in that example here, okay, so again, in our example we have that lambda is a partition, I think I said 15, all right, and the length of that partition Well, how many parts have I got? One, two, three, four, five, is that six? Something like that. Okay? All right. So that's our partition. For us, it will be convenient to always write or to often write a diagrammatic representation. So the, and well, the diagram, so I won't always say young, sort of, when we start filling the diagram of a partition, and typically we talk about things like young tableau, and we get to that later, but the diagram of a partition uh, well, I'm going to define that through an example, because I don't want to be very formal here. So again, if we take the partition ahead over there, so lambda, let's repeat that. So four, four, what did I cook up? Three, two, one, one. As I said, I'm not usually not gonna write down the zeros. We just write down four boxes here. So just a left aligned sequence of uh, rows of boxes, of course, representing the parts of the partition. Something like that. Okay? All right. So now if I, if I take a particular, we, okay, so we also say, I comma J, so maybe I'll write that in here. So this is going to be I, and this is going to label J. So then we say that IJ is an element of lambda. Well, clearly, if I goes up to the length, and well, for such an I, J ranges between one and lambda I, okay? So, all right. So, then we can say there. And then we also have something that's called the hook length. And again, we'll see more of the hook length when we look at sure functions. So the hook length of a box, that's 
part of my partition that's given by so okay let's draw it in the example before I give you the formal definition and maybe I'll use some of the color here so if I pick my favorite box you're essentially just counting all of this here okay so well if I do that it's lambda i and now I need something okay notation that I haven't yet introduced so maybe I'll write that here as well so we can actually properly write it down so the the conjugate lambda prime of lambda is obtained by reflecting the diagram okay that so so in other words if that's lambda then if we want lambda prime so I take conjugation all you do is well did we say earlier that was length 6 so that would be something like this here then we get four boxes and well what is it three and two again correct me if I something like this okay looks reasonably close to the conjugate partition okay so if this is lambda here and this here is it's conjugate all right so if we have that well then we can talk about the hook length so it's simply the row length plus the column length but then if you look at that picture we've got a little bit too much so I need to subtract something okay so in particular something like this am I going all right here so the larger J is of course the shorter the hook length and the larger I is the shorter the hook length so it should be something like this and okay all right so let's take our same example I may need a plus one here so let's okay maybe plus question mark let's it's quite possible we're just going to figure it out okay well it should be clear if we take for example a corner box so for example something like this then the hook length is of course one okay so in this particular case so it's probably we need another plus one right two because in that case uh, lambda j prime is equal to j or sorry lambda i is equal to j and lambda i prime is equal to lambda j prime is equal to i so we get zero so we do need to add a one absolutely and I see if I write too close to this actually it's not readable but <laughs> so let me write that again a little bit further to the left and correct this time lambda i with lambda j prime minus i minus j and we certainly need a plus one here okay so what is it four four three two and I had a double one so there we go so we can just put in these numbers and as I said we get of course ones over here uh, this one is two this one is three this should be five three so that's maybe four okay what have we got three six of course it's, it's impossible to do this correctly quickly on the board uh, maybe another six here four I guess eight and over here should be six plus three something like that okay in any case you can you can do this better than I can so uh, all right okay so that's just the all of the hook length simply written so of course that's just a multi-set okay
All right? So, as I said, we'll come back to that when we talk about the sure functions uh, later on. All right? Um, so one last, so I had a list there, but I wasn't quite finished. So maybe I'll just continue it over here. So the, and define this. The difference of two consecutive columns of my diagram. So if you take the difference of two columns, it precisely tells you how many parts of size exactly i are in my partition. OK, so that's the multiplicity. Parts of sides equal to i. Okay. Again, we'll we'll see this arising a lot more. All right. Um, so then I need to sort of finish this set of definitions for partitions. Again, this is a statistic that arises a lot on, in symmetric function theory. And what you do is you simply sum up all of the rows of the partition, but you weight them by, well, i minus 1. OK? So again, if we take our favorite example, And I count it a two and a double one, something like this. So essentially, take the first row, but it has weight zero, so you just put these numbers in there. And of course, all you're doing is adding up these numbers. And so that tells you immediately if I don't add them up by row, but I add them up by column. Well, the length of the, that's just, right, the length of the jth column is just, or the ith column is just exactly lambda i or lambda prime i. And so if you add up zero up to that number, you just get something like this. OK? So, and again, we'll see this more when we talk about sure functions. All right. Any questions about this? So, as I said, these partitions are going to essentially index our, well, any basis that we have of the ring of symmetric functions. We need a little bit more combinatorics. And that is what we get if we look at containment of partitions. OK, so they say that, well, let's say we write that mu is contained in lambda, OK, if so this is containment. If lambda i minus mu i, that's always. So you just compare all of the parts of your partition. OK. Well, sorry. We don't, yeah, we write that. and. If, so if you have containment, uh, then set difference, or I'll mostly, unlike McDonald, I'll just write it like that, because that's also how we see that sort of an index of a skew sure function. And again, we get to that 
part a bit later, um, is, is known as a skew shape. or slash skew diagram. So let's make up another example. So let's stick with our choice of lambda, and maybe for mu I take 3, 3, and 2. Well, e.g. lambda is above. And what did I say? 3. Three. Okay, so I believe we've got containment. So then we have that mu. And let's write down what the skew shape is. So three, so we're just left with a single box here. Then again, we have three, so we have one box below that. Then two, so we've got another box, something like this here. And I had another two, so there's nothing. And then below that, so let's say here there is, there's nothing, and then I have, okay? So this would be our skew shape in this particular case. Is that right? Any corrections here or looks reasonably okay? Three, three, so we have two here, one there, nothing here, and we have another two ones. Okay? So we're interested in several types of skew shapes in particular. Okay, well, so well, let's put this formally in a definition. So let, again, we, I have containment of partitions. So then the skew shape is the horizontal strip stroke is too short to use for writing okay if well if this has at most, one box in each column. Okay? So this is certainly not a horizontal strip, okay? Because we see that in the, this column here and that column there, we've got two boxes, so it's no good, okay? But we also need the notion of a vertical strip, the same story, and lambda over mu is called a vertical strip. Okay. Uh, if well, it's, it's simply the conjugate of everything I've said so far, as at most one box in each row. So now I think, okay, that's vertical strip. So that example is certainly a vertical strip, but it's not a horizontal strip, okay? And what we'll see later, so why do I care about these particular shapes. Well, later how we're going to build up the sure function, either using something that's known as the branching rule or something that 
we call vertex operators, and so it's certainly not going to be topic of, of today, the, they essentially act like building up your sure function index by partition by adding these horizontal strips one at a time. Okay, you can even view this, given that this has something to do with probability here. So for example, Okunkov uses that picture to essentially have some sort of Markov process where you're starting to grow your sure function one step at a time and using adding horizontal strips and so on. Okay, so that's quite important. Uh, certainly also if you like the sort of point of view of random partitions and so on, then these things occur all the time. All right. Okay, well, there's one more type of skew shape that's important for us. Again, in the context of vertex operators also, I'm not really going to talk about that much, although there's one assignment question about this, or I'm not sure I should call them an assignment, whatever, tutorial question about this, if you want to understand the characters of the symmetric group in terms of sure functions. And then you don't need horizontal and vertical strips, but you need border strips of ribbons, or ribbons, so, okay, so let me define that as well. Okay, so let, again, I want two partitions with containment, so then, border strip ribbon maybe ribbon is a nicer term but anyway I think most people use border strip if uh, well first of all needs to be connected And it contains no two by two square. So something like this. Okay? So our example over here is certainly not a border strip. If we don't have this two by two square going on, so that's good, but of course, connectedness is an issue. So, so something like, it would look something like this. Okay? That would be a good border strip, where of course this here, right, has always exactly one here and so on, etc. Okay, so ribbon or little snake and things like that. Yes? That's, this is, that, uh, that's not good enough for connectedness. Okay, so good question. Not connected. Here, I think I'm missing an end, but okay. So you really want it, as I said, if you take an actual ribbon, right, it, it's not good enough to, uh, it would break if you tried to put that in your hair or so, or well, you and I don't have enough hair, but some other people, younger people, then that would certainly not, uh, not be good, okay? So yeah, thanks for that question. I should have made that clear, okay? And so, as I said, I'm, I'm not really going to talk much about this, but if you want to understand the characters of the symmetric group, you can express it in, in terms of things that are called uh, essentially border strip tableau. So that's a tableau made up of 
these border strips, okay, where each border strip is filled by different integer, one, two, three, and so on, okay? So again, these shapes are pretty important. All right. So before we at least get our first sort of little lemma, I need one final definition that of interlacing partitions. Okay. So again, definition. Well, that lambda mu b partitions. Then uh, we write. Okay, this is sort of a curly type. I don't want to later. I'm also talk, going to talk about order on partition and dominance order. That's not this. And um, well, let's first if. See the parts of the partitions, the interlace. Okay, so uh, are said to interlace. Okay. Well, so this certainly for me, right, this implies that we have containment, okay? Because I always have that lambda i is greater or equal to mu i for all i. So this is certainly stronger than containment, right? Okay. So well, these definitions, they're not all independent. Okay, so let's give this as a lemma. Let me take a pair of partitions with partition containment. Okay, so then is a horizontal strip. If and only if. partitions interlace, okay? So whether you prefer to think in terms of interlacing partitions or you prefer to sort of the language of horizontal strips, you essentially you have a choice, okay? Because they're one and the same thing. All right, so let's see if we can understand why this is the case. Okay, so well, so note that, so let's say that I have a box that is in my skew shape, okay? Uh, so what does that mean? Well, that means that, okay, so pictorially, I've lost my color. OK, 
Okay, so let's draw a little picture here. So I've got a box here that's in my skew shape. Okay, so in other words, and it's in row i. Okay, so in other words, mu i should not get up to that box because otherwise it would be removed from my skew shape. Okay, so mu i is maybe goes up to here. So that would be mu i. And so I found a box ij to the right of that. And of course over here, this would be lambda i. Okay, so that's sort of the situation. So if we have a box that's in that skew shape, well, that tells us that mu i is strictly less than j, and of course j, well, ranges from this position all the way up to lambda i, okay? So, all right. So, so in particular, If I have such a box, so such a J exists in that row, then of course it also tells me that mu i, but that we already, well, let's not, okay, let's not write this down yet. We don't really need it at this point. Okay. Okay, so now, so now what happens if I have the situation where I would have two boxes on top of each other in my skew shape. I don't want that because I want to be a horizontal strip, so I can't have two boxes on top of each other, all right? So hence, uh, if ij is an element of the skew shape and i plus 1j, so it's the same column coordinate, but I've gone one row further down, well then I have mu i less than j less than or equal to lambda i, and maybe I'll write the next one first, by the way, so mu i plus one Okay. And also, mu i less than j okay? I'm just copying this for two consecutive rows like that. Okay? Well, if If, if we're interlacing, oops, that tells me that lambda i plus 1 is less than or equal to mu i, okay? So if this is the case, then lambda i plus 1 is less than or equal to mu i. So I imagine that that's the case, all right? So that would give us, if I go back upstairs, that would give me over here an additional inequality, okay? But then I see that j is strictly less than j, and that's never going to happen, of course, okay? So, so that... The, let's call it just the above, cannot occur. Okay, so in other words, if we're interlacing, we're certainly a horizontal strip, right? So in other words, i.e., if that, 
and the horizontal strip. Okay? So, well, let's do the converse. So, conversely, let be a horizontal a horizontal strip and let me say i plus 1j so now i have in row i plus 1 i have again a box in my skew shape what I want to show is that the box, box immediately above that, well, I know because I'm a horizontal strip, that tells me that the box immediately above this box cannot be in my skew shape, okay? Okay, so then I, J is not in here, okay? So in other words, so let's just refer to this as star, okay? So what we have is that if you're in there, then this must be satisfied, okay? So that can be satisfied. So that tells me that mu i must be greater or equal to j, okay? And I can push, so I look at the row above that, and I can push j as big as I can. So in particular, that tells me that, okay? by just taking the and that's that's it. Okay. So as I said, from now on we can just view these two things as as essentially the same. All right. I think that's probably apart from the dominance order all I wanted to say about partition. So let's do that as well and then I'm done with talking about partitions. Okay, so Right, so that's the last thing, definition, that's of dominance order. Again, we'll, we'll need that to, well, we'll, we'll see later this afternoon, I hope, why, why this is important. Okay, so let Let me have two partitions of the same size, let's say n, and lambda is dominates mu if lambda 1 plus dot, 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 lambda i is greater or equal to mu one or i. Okay. So, of course, dominance order, but it's not a total order. So, for any n greater or equal to six. which is a partial partial 
Washington. Okay. Um, all right. Um, maybe in view of the speed with which I'm going, I'm not going to, you can just do this as a little homework exercise to, for example, do the partial order for partitions of size six. Okay, you'll see that you get something looking like that and then it separates and I can't quite remember where it separates again and then you go on like that. Okay, anyway. So let's just say example that's just homework. Okay, any questions so far before we move on to the ring of symmetric functions? Everyone happy? Okay. All right. So finally we can, we have the necessary language to talk about symmetric functions. Maybe I'll start here in the middle. Okay, so no, let's put the end third. Okay, the ring of symmetric functions. Running out of chalk here. Okay? So, first, what I'm going to do is define the ring of symmetric functions in n variables for you, and then how you formally obtain the ring of symmetric functions in infinitely many variables. And that will be very important for us because I want to view this ring as a lambda ring that will be for tomorrow, and I need the ring in infinitely many variables for that. Okay? Okay. So maybe just for convenience, let Well, maybe I shouldn't do that because that can actually be confusing when later I'm going to use infinitely many variables as well. So, okay, so let's just do it like this. So let Sn be the symmetric group on, and I'm a combinatorialist, so I'll say n letters, but of course I just mean the symmetric group acting on, well, symmetric group of uh, any set of n objects, okay? And we like to call them letters, okay. So then, the ring of symmetric functions in n variables, and I'm going to work over, well, I'll say z, you can say z if you want to, it's just a polynomial ring in n variables. But, of course, I've got the natural symmetric group action, so I'm only interested in those polynomials that remain unchanged if I act with the symmetric group, okay? So this is the ring of symmetric functions. In n variables. Okay? All right. So, 
the first remark is that this is a, and that's very important for us, this ring is graded, so it's graded by degree, okay? And we need this grading in order to define the ring of symmetric functions in infinitely many variables. Okay, so it's graded by degree. So it just means that you look at all of the symmetric functions of fixed total degree, let's say k. And so we can write lambda n where this is the, okay? Well, so that's just all symmetric functions in my ring of symmetric functions such that the degree of f is equal to k. And in order to make this a proper subspace, of course, I always need to chuck in zero as well. OK? All right. So that's the, the grading. Um, Okay, and that's, I guess, all I need to say about that. So let's now look at a basis, okay? So there's one obvious basis in this ring of symmetric functions that's essentially when we just symmetrize a single monomial, and so this gives rise to the monomial symmetric functions. Okay, so definition, that's monomial symmetric functions, so m lambda in n variables, so how is that defined? So as I said, I'm simply going to, well, let's first write it down formally. So I take x to the power, so, okay, x, that's simply okay. So I should have ad added here, so let, so I take a partition whose length is at most n, okay? So I can write this as lambda 1 up to lambda n, nothing beyond that, so this is simply x1 lambda 1, x2, lambda 2, xn, lambda n. Of course, a single monomial like that is not symmetric, but if we essentially sum this over the sn orbit of this partition, then we get something by, by construction that is symmetric, okay? So in other words, you sum of all permutations, but of course you remove, you mod out by the stabilizer of the partition, so that's just the summing over all orbits. And so this is going to be a symmetric function. Okay? If that's too formal for you, I can also simply write this as x to the alpha. And so alpha goes over all distinct permutations of lambda, okay? That's the same thing, of course, as the orbit of lambda under the action of the symmetric group, so, okay? So this trivially, so just by construction, gives you a basis of lambda n and of course, if you restrict yourself to those 
monomial symmetric functions that have degree exactly k. In other words, your partition lambda is a partition of k. You simply have a basis of your piece of degree k, okay? So let's just say by construction, M lambda, okay, such that lambda is a partition of k, and of course the length of lambda less than or equal to n uh, is a basis of the kth degree piece of my ring of symmetric functions, okay? Any questions about that? All right. So what I'm going to do is these symmetric functions, they're in fact stable. Okay. And so maybe I should also say if you want to be fancy, okay, so that is a free Z module. Okay, so of degree, okay, so, well, how many elements have we got? Or maybe I shouldn't call it, it's too confusing here because we already have other degrees, so let's just use the word rank, probably better. Rank, okay, something like, well, okay, number of partitions, number of partitions of K, Of length of moles. Okay. okay. Of course, that doesn't have a structure of a ring itself because if I multiply two elements together, of course, I get something that's degree 2k rather than k, but uh, it certainly will give me a, a z module. And of course, free just means that we have a basis. Well, I've written you a basis, so, so that's all good, okay? Well, so the M lambda uh, are stable. So what does that mean? So I take symmetric function on n variables, and I said x n plus 1 up to x m equal to 0, okay, so in other words, I'm assuming that, okay, so I'm assuming that I have some integer m that is at least n, otherwise I'm not doing anything here. So do that. Well, I either get the symmetric function or this monomial symmetric function on n variables. That's if the length of my partition is less than or equal to n. If the length is between n strictly greater than n and m, then of course I get zero. Okay. So this stability property allows me to define the ring of symmetric functions in infinitely many variables. If you don't, oh, if you, that would certainly, uh, yes, no, we're certainly uh, right. So again, but there's no, there's no issue now because I have. So yes, otherwise we would not have stability. It's a good point. Um, okay. 
Okay, so so this allows us to define lambda as a ring of symmetric functions. In infinitely many variables. Okay, so how does this work? Okay, so again, let m be greater or equal to n and define. Map, um, well, maybe I'll put the M first and then the N from lambda M to lambda N, okay, well, as follows rho M lambda. It's simply. start with m variables and I just take n variables. Okay? So what we see here is if I, well, okay, that's of course if length of lambda is less than or equal to n and otherwise I get zero. Okay, so it's easy to see what the kernel is. Simply all those monomial symmetric functions with length between M and N. All right, so. Okay, so kernel is simply the span of the integers of those monomial symmetric functions such that okay. So what we have here is a surjective ring homomorphism, okay? So rho of n objective ring home from lambda n to lambda n, okay? All right, that's good. So also, rho, if I want to go from M to N, what I can do is I can first go to L. Well, I can do this in the other order. And then I go from L to n, okay, and of course this requires that n, okay, so I can just do this in, in smaller steps if I want to, and of course I also have is the identity. map on lambda n. Okay? So essentially if you have such homomorphisms, then this defines what is known as an inverse system. Okay? And I'm struggling with the chalk here. Do we have some longer? Nope. 
lots of chalk here. All right, good. Okay. All right, so we've got these inverse system, okay? So in other words, the set, I've got all these rings, symmetric functions of n variables, and I take the set of all of those maps, and that forms an inverse system If you haven't seen this formally defined before, it's just this, okay? So of course you can do this for not just in the context of the ring of symmetric functions, but that's really all we need here. So here in our case, as I said, the notion of inverse system is of course much more general, but for us it's just an inverse system of, well, we had seen earlier that this is a free Z module. So this is just an inverse system of Z modules, okay? The inverse system of and essentially the ring of symmetric functions in infinitely many variables. Well, what we would like to do if we're a little bit naive is just say, well, it's the inverse limit of this system. But then things go wrong and you end up with what's actually the closure of the ring of symmetric functions. So we, it's, we need to do a little bit more, okay? So, so let's just say we would like But that's not good. So again, lost my color. Because it gives us slightly too much. Okay? So what we're going to do, well, we've got this grading that I haven't used. Okay? But that's no good. So we, so we need. I'm simply going to restrict my maps to components of degree k. So that's just restricted to the kth component. All right? So, so note. If, well, so we already had that m was always greater or equal to n for us. But let's now say that I take k sufficiently small. What can we say? Well, if k is sufficiently small, what's the largest partition or the, the greatest? Right, if I, a partition of degree k, its maximal length is exactly k. Okay, because I can't get any longer than this for a partition of degree k. All right? So, in other words, as long as this k is less than n, if I apply this map here, nothing is in the kernel. Okay? Okay, so we know that if this is the case, then we are injected, okay, well, of course, from what's the injection about? Well, because I started with the kth degree piece, of course, the degree is not going to change, so I just injective, but we're also surjective, so now we're bijective, okay? And hence, hence bijective. 
So that means that, in fact, we have an isomorphism, okay? If we look at these graded pieces. So now we are in business, and I can define what is meant by the ring of symmetric functions in infinitely many variables. I do exactly what I naively did before, but said it's no good. I haven't really told you why it's no good. I'll give you an example in a, in a moment, okay? Um, so, so, okay, so now, okay, so therefore, we are bijective. So now we define the ring of symmetric functions in infinitely many variables as simply what I tried to do earlier. Well, it's not a ring at the moment because I'm only defining a graded piece, okay? Again, it's just the inverse limit with respect to that same uh, inverse system, just put k's over here, nothing changes as long as, right, if k is, and, and so now we can define this. Okay? And so, all right, so this is good because this is that as long as k is less than n, right, because we, so in other words, lambda k, and lambda nk, well, again, I'm always assuming now that k is less than or equal to n, okay, so I start with some sufficiently large n, and then I in start increasing n, okay, are isomorphic, of course, as I said, not as rings, because they're not rings, so again, there are some more figures that module. So to turn this thing into a ring, we now just take put all of these graded pieces together. And that's the ring. Okay, so formally, again, if you're not so familiar with inverse limits, an element of, well, let me just define an element of the kth graded piece. Uh, if, well, well, let's just say it looks like All right, so what does it look like? All right, if you have every graded piece, then of course this is it, you just put them together, and you have your entire ring. Um, so it's just sequences such that f n and if I apply rho m n to f of m, I essentially get all right, f of n. That's that's sort of the idea. All right, 
But that's a little bit too abstract. We don't really want to think of this as sort of sequences like that. OK? So let's just do it more concretely. So let me just give you a few monomial symmetric functions that are in my ring. Well, with the zero partition, I just write as zero. So that's just one. For example, m indexed by this partition is just, well, let me really write it out for you. That's just x1 plus x2 plus dot, 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 and so on. OK? For example, m2, I simply get x1 squared plus x2 squared. So they're not really functions because we have infinitely many variables, right? So they're to just view them as formal objects. Maybe one more example. Well, if I take 1, 1, it would simply be something like this. I less than j, x i, x j, and so on. OK? And you can check that, right? If you set all of the variables beyond the end to 0, you get precisely the f of n. So they're all contained in, in this and, and so on. OK. Well, I don't have, yes. If you, well, but are you unhappy with this or? Well, I wouldn't consider, well, I wouldn't say that's the, not the right point of view. I mean, you can do this more universally, really, in terms of categories. That's really where this comes from. But I wouldn't consider this a direct limit, unless you mean something different with that than I do. But uh, well, I mean, effectively, of course, that's what I've. D I mean. I could have written things in a different order if you wanted to, and it wouldn't have changed the story. So, um, okay, that really doesn't matter. I can, of course, go from, I can go either way. I mean, after all, we've, we've achieved, right, a we've achieved the bijection between these Z modules when we work with lambda n of degree k and lambda m of degree k. So whether you like to go from left to right or right to left, it really doesn't matter, because these things are isomorphic. So, I don't think it sort of adds anything to one, yeah, to the what's going on. All right. Well, I've of course taken too much time. Let's still very quickly introduce a few other bases of this ring of symmetric functions in infinitely many variables. Right, because I think we'll probably need that for some of the exercises. In particular, I want to at least do the fundamental theorem of symmetric functions. So hopefully, you'll give me time to do that, and then I'll stop. Okay. So. Okay. So let's call this. The fundamental theorem. of symmetric functions. So essentially, this was already known to Newton. But of course, Newton never formally defined any of these kinds of objects. But all right, in, in the finite form, he certainly knew this. OK, so, so first of all, I need to define what are the elementary symmetric functions. And they're simply defined as the monomial symmetric functions. And I'm going to write it like this, OK? The partition, this just means R once. So in other words, it's just a column of height R, OK? If you don't like that, Here's something more explicit. 
I1, well, less than I2, less than I3, well, less than maybe dot, 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 time for that, less to IR, X I1, X I2, X I R. Okay? There it is very explicitly. So be the R elementary symmetric function. Okay? So, of course, why people were interested in studying these, well, long, long time ago, essentially, of course, because the, right, you can express the roots of polynomial equations in terms of these elementary symmetric functions. And Newton was certainly very well aware of that. And whether he was the first to observe that, I, I, I do not know. But in any case, um, generally attributed to him, okay? So the point is that these elementary symmetric functions, they're also a Z basis of the ring of symmetric functions. But then usually, I mean, we talk about the term algebraic basis. Okay, maybe let me first, before I state that, Note that we can easily compute the generating function. Okay, so now let me write in the variables here. Okay, because essentially what we're doing is summing over all subset of the integers and, well, how will I, okay, because let me just write it like this, product i in that subset xi, okay, so if I, well, that's the elementary symmetric function that I need to multiply by its degree, so it's something like this. But of course, each letter i, it only either occurs not at all or it occurs at most once because all the variables are, are different. Okay, and so that immediately tells me that I get oops, not an er, rather put an xi in there. Okay? All right. And we'll see this generating function a lot more tomorrow. So let's now state the actual fundamental theorem of symmetric functions. And let's very quickly prove it. So, well, I can state it here. Theorem um, Okay, maybe well, so let's just say it's Newton. Although Newton only did probably the finite case, but it's good enough for us. Okay? So how do you Prove this. So that just means that any symmetric function, you can essentially write this, right, as, I mean, we call this an algebraic basis. So as a linear combination of words in the elementary symmetric function. Okay? So, so let me define sort of a it's going to be then a linear basis. Okay, so this, this is now an elementary symmetric function on a single index 
So like I have over here, OK? All right, so what does this look like? Well, let's first take ER. I already indicated you have this one column here. So monomials in, OK, because each piece here in this product is just a single elementary symmetric function. It's a bunch of a sum over monomials. If I look at the single monomial, uh, so can be represented So again, I do it diagrammatically. I put x i one in here, and x i two, and so on, x i r. Okay. So if we again, if you look at the definition here, so each of these variables that are, is going to occur, it's a single monomial. So this is just Right, in correspondence with just the monomial x i r. Of course, I've got many monomials, but this is just one of them. Okay? So, e.g., one of the terms could be a 1, 3, I can't repeat, okay, 4, 6, and maybe whatever, 27, and maybe that's where I stop, okay? Something like that. Well, now I've written the numbers rather than the xi. I apologize. But this is x1, x3, x4, which is slightly more economical to write like this, especially given that I only have four minutes left. OK, but hopefully it's so. OK, so this would correspond to the monomial x1, x3, x4, x6, and x27. OK? <laughs> All right. So so now I'm interested in a whole bunch of these elementaries so therefore each monomial in E lambda can be represented well. And again, I'm not going to write the x's, I'm just going to write the i's. Okay. E one, but now I need an extra index. I two of one up to i. Well, the first part here would be lambda 1. And then maybe over here, I 2, I 2, 2, up to last boxes. Of course, it can be anywhere. Well, let's say it's over here, I lambda 2. Two and so on. Okay, so the final column here, of course, which is the shortest, so I'm running out of space because I ordered this as a partition. So this is, of course, I1. Well, uh, lambda 1 prime. So this is really the length. And you can't read that, but something like this. OK, uh, so this is, I, I should say this as a tableau. The shape, well, because I have the columns represent the sizes of the parts, so that's eff effectively as a, of shape, lambda prime. OK, so every monomial contributing to that thing can be represented by 
a tableau on the conjugate shape. All right? OK. So what, why does this help us? Well, now look at the, so nearly there. Because we can observe that if you look at the kth row of this tableau, all of the numbers in the kth row must be at least k, all right? Because it's, because it's strictly increasing going down. So if I have the most efficient filling, I would just put a 1 in all of the top row, 2 in all of the second row, but I can never have a 2, say, in the third row, because on top of that, I already need a 1 and a 2, and all these numbers are distinct. So, so note that all entries in row k are greater or equal to k. Moreover, we can have, so what I can do, as I said, the most efficient way, if I want the lowest possible monomial, I will put once in here. I would put twos over here. Well, and this here, remember, that's lambda one. So in the last row, I put lambda ones. This is sort of the smallest monomial, well, in a, I don't know, not well-defined sense of small, that I can create. OK? So this, of course, corresponds to x1. This, the shape was the conjugate. And so on. OK? Which I'll write as, using my earlier notation, like this. That's a prime, not an x. OK? So in particular, that arises. So that means that the lowest term, or really the highest, I guess, in terms of dominance order, is precisely the monomial symmetric function indexed by lambda prime. So from that, follows that E lambda, that's this term here. Well, that's one monomial. I already know it's symmetric. So I have the symmetrizer of this. So I really get the full monomial, of course, plus terms that are strictly less than lambda prime in some coefficients that I don't care about. Okay, and so, well, this is obviously convertible, and you can solve this. This leading coefficient is 1, and so this implies that E lambda, well, forms a linear Greek basis. of lambda, and in other words, that's the same as saying that algebraically, we can write it like this. So let me finish by writing, so note, if I'm only interested in the ring of symmetric functions in n variables, and maybe that's all you care about, well, an elementary symmetric function on E r, where r is greater than n, simply going to give you 0. So, and this is really what Newton already observed. But if you just look at, so this is properly 
what Newton did, rather than working in infinitely many variables. Okay, so and I think I didn't get as far as I'd hoped, but I think it's probably time time to stop. So hopefully uh, I'll, I'll pick up pace tomorrow, and uh, yeah, I'll leave it here. So thank you. But I should, of course, before I stop, if there's any more questions. Yes? Sorry? Well, I really only, you try to now just solve this system, okay? So that's a very good question, and maybe I should make that a homework question. Try to, try to see. We will we'll actually get later, we will we'll get more explicit expressions of these symmetric functions in terms of each other where we can certainly do this explicitly, but this is already, this is already enough. If you, if you don't care about what these, what these are act actually are. So I should have said, so thanks for the question. So, all right. And that's maybe, maybe not immediately clear to you, but it's essentially just follows from the description I have over here. We just peel off M lambda prime and the rest, I can again just express this in terms of elementary symmetric functions, and each elementary symmetric function cannot occur pi times or whatever. It can, of course, only occur an integer number of times. Okay, so as I said, if you're interested, of course, and people often are, they want to know what the exact connection coefficients are, but here it's sort of obvious from the construction that you're not going to get something that's not integral, okay? But yeah, so I should certainly have added this here. All right. Any other things that need clarification? All right. <laughs>